Welcome to NCSS Here For You. Since 1958, Northwestern Counseling and Support Services has been providing access to high-quality services which promote healthy living and emotional well-being to the residents of Franklin and Grand Isle Counties. Over the years, as the needs of the community have changed, so too have the programs and services that we make available to assist children, adolescents, adults, families, and seniors. We take our role in the community seriously and strive to provide the highest quality services. According to Eric Erickson, a noted developmental psychologist, every person must pass through a series of eight interrelated stages over the entire life cycle. NCSS provides a continuum of services to meet the needs of individuals who at any point seek assistance. NCSS's purpose is creating a stronger community one person at a time. Now, let's get to today's show. I'm Joe Halco, Director of Community Relations for Northwestern Counseling and Support Services, and welcome to another episode of NCSS Here For You. Each month on this program, we discuss a human services topic, and we do that with staff that represent one of our three service divisions. Our three service divisions are Behavioral Health Services, Children, Youth, and Family Services, and Developmental Services. And on occasion, we have guests from organizations that NCSS collaborates with throughout the year. This month's episode is titled, Meet Todd Bauman. For the past two months, Todd Bauman has been settling into his new role as the Executive Director of NCSS. Todd brings a wealth of pertinent experience to the position. What brought Todd to NCSS? How does he see service delivery currently? And how does he see the future as we continue to evolve in the changing world of health care reform? To discuss all of this and more, I'm pleased to introduce this month's guest, the recently named Executive Director of NCSS, Todd Bauman. Todd, welcome to this month's show. Thank you, Joe. So to get started, um, what originally brought you to NCSS 12 years ago? Well, I've always been interested in community mental health and, and, and community-based services. I, I started working uh, actually down in Chittenden County at the Howard Center Yes. Uh, back in 1990 and really enjoyed the community aspects of working in a, in a, a designated agency. Uh, from there, I went to the state, which I, um, I really enjoyed that experience there. Got to travel all over Vermont, got mm -hmm. to see how other people were doing uh, the work. But what I really found once I got to the state was I missed the local aspect. I missed the local partnerships, the collaborations that you can really have at the local community. And when this job, when uh, the children's director job became available about 12 years ago, NCSS was definitely a place I wanted to work. And a lot of that was because of uh, Ted Mabel, mm -hmm. he, my predecessor. Yep. He was somebody that I had always heard incredible things about. Uh, and people told me, if you ever have a chance to work for Ted Mabel, you take that chance because it'll be the best time of your career. And so I wanted to work for Ted, so that was why I came to NCSS 12 years ago. And um, you were one of 68 candidates that applied for the executive director position. What was it that attracted you about the position itself? I think, I think this is a very exciting time in healthcare in general. The field is completely changing, um, is rapidly evolving. I think historically, uh, services tended to be put in place once people were ill, mm -hmm. that people would come in and access care um, after they were sick. And what has ha what's happening now, I think, in healthcare is we are trying to think about our services differently. Yeah. We're trying to develop models of care to proactively intervene and keep people well. And we know that we can't do that by ourselves. We have to do that in partnership mm -hmm. with other community providers. And so, um, you know, people like The Notch, um, NMC, Home Health, some of our healthcare provider partners, we've really tried to uh, work closely with mm -hmm. to um, develop new ways of, of, of providing care. And that's something that I've just been really excited about. Now, during the past legislative session, there was much discussion about uh, adverse childhood experiences, which is also known to many as uh, ACEs, the acronym. 
And if you could just uh, explain what is ACEs and how does it differ from previous screening tools that have been used? So um, the ACE is a tool, Adverse Childhood Experience, and it's a tool that looks at um, what has happened in a person's life, primarily in childhood, that um, may uh, have provided a level of adversity, something that they had to overcome in, when they were a child. Mm -hmm. And there, it looks at things like uh, poverty, um, abuse, neglect, uh, parental divorce, um, food insecurity, housing insecurity. Those are some of the questions that the ACE tool looks at. So as a tool, it gives us a score. But what I really like about that tool is it allows us to look at the way we provide care differently. So we know that if people score high on the ACEs, we know that they are more likely to have health issues as, as adults. Mm -hmm. Health issues and could be asthma, could be COPD, um, diabetes, obesity. Um, so if we can limit those traumatic events, those adverse events that happen in childhood, we can actually mitigate some of the health concerns that people will have um, as adults. And so it gives us a chance to kind of, again, develop our service delivery structures to mitigate some of those. And I would imagine, Todd, that uh, there are many, even those that we collaborate with, who don't realize uh, that NCSS is now immersed in ACEs and uh, that it's just part of, of what we do. When, when you think of the way we provide care, we have already shifted um, significantly towards a more proactive model of care. How do we intervene early to um, keep people well? Some of those things I think that we've done um, is uh, we've, we've looked at developing our models. I, I met with our CRT program. That's a program for adults with uh, uh, severe mental illness. Mm -hmm. And we actually went around the room and people kind of were reporting out on some of the work that they did. And they talked about maybe 15 situations, 15 individuals that they were helping. And we often think of behavioral health as how do we uh, mitigate symptoms, symptoms of mental illness. But what we found when we went around the room, much of the work that people were doing was really around things like housing stability, giving people um, community connections, giving people um, make sure they had food security, enough food to eat. And when you think about, when we talk about our services, we often don't talk about those things. Yeah. But those are really the cornerstone of, of a lot of what we do as strategies to help people uh, stay well. Other types of programs that we would do are uh, de our developmental services mm -hmm. division. Mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to meet with our standing committee just last week. And one of the things that they are incredibly proud of is that their peer supports. And that's a way that they've created the system to provide peer support to each other as a way to kind of alleviate loneliness. And if people have more connections, we can build a more resilient community. And that again is a way to intervene to help people stay well. They're actually, it's worked so well that they actually want to expand that and actually move towards helping people stabilize even in crisis through just peer contact. And those are just some of the types of approaches that I think we're developing as a way to, uh, again, move our services upstream to be mm -hmm. more proactive mm -hmm. and address some of those um, adverse conditions that people have in their lives. Mm -hmm. And um, let's move on a little bit here now to social determinants. And I think that's another area where a lot of times people perhaps get a little confused. They think of NCSS as uh, outpatient and psychiatry and crisis perhaps, but not a lot of the other work that's, that's being done around that and with in conjunction with that. So with that being said, how does NCSS assist residents relative to the social determinants of health that include areas like social status, uh, early life experiences, stress, housing, work? I think ACEs, adverse childhood experience and social determinants really go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And when you think about social determinants, I think of things like stable housing, uh, food security, employment, adequate transportation, um, access to health care. These are things that we know people need in order to be successful. So back to that, um, uh, our CRT program, our, our program to work with severe people with severe yep. mental illness helping them have stable housing. If they don't have stable housing, 
the rest of what we can bring to the table almost doesn't matter. We mm -hmm. have to have those core um, um, issues dealt with that, uh, that people bring, such as, again, housing and food. Um, other types of things, I think, that people may not uh, think of social determinants. We've just recently partnered with, uh, with Wynn Goodrich. He's one of our local superintendents. And he came forward and said, can we partner to address truancy? Mm -hmm. How do we help kids remain in school? And we actually came at that as, um, if you think about truancy, you can come at it from a health care reform initiative that we know if we can keep elementary kids in school, get them connected to their school, get them to feel safe and comfortable in their school, work with their parents on that, we know that they're more likely to then be successful in high school, more likely to graduate. And if we can help them to graduate, they're more likely to have a job, which then allows them to have stable housing. Mm -hmm. So that's one more example of, instead of waiting until um, someone is in a health crisis as an adult, if we can intervene early, help them address those social determinants, get them that, that um, education, that housing, we know that we can mitigate some of those needs later on. So we actually are approaching truancy as a healthcare initiative, mm -hmm. and we're doing that in partnership with our local schools. You know, and speaking of uh, local schools and Wynn and his supervisory union, and um, reminds me of, uh, you know, NCSS, of course, has brought mental health first aid and youth mental health first aid to this part of the state. And one of the more amazing uh, displays of collaboration was the time where from a youth mental health first aid situation that I think it was 120 or 125 staff yeah. were trained in one day yeah. which is like unprecedented mm -hmm. um, which was done at MVU. Mm -hmm. um, once again I think this is a situation where you talk about people thinking outside the box and how because typically when those uh, trainings are being held it's limited to 20 to 25 at a time but I know that NCSS thought outside the box as far as the number of uh, trainers they could have available for a day. Mm -hmm. And then I guess it was in an in-service day is when they yeah. did all the training for mm -hmm. them. And I, I guess the reason I bring that up right now is because this is another aspect of being collaborative from a community standpoint and getting others who aren't in our field to understand a little bit about some of the early warning signs they may be seeing in their students. We think mental health first aid, youth mental health first aid, um, in general, is one of those things that we feel like if we bring to our community, we can promote overall wellness within the community as a whole. And it's really built on the premise of our community will be stronger if everyone has basic first aid skills, both to recognize people in a, in a mm -hmm. physical health crisis mm -hmm. and being able to intervene. And along the same lines, we think our community will be better, will be more well, if everyone has basic mental health skills, that they can identify people that may be in crisis or may be in need, they can intervene and help people access the help that they need. And um, we were the first community in Vermont that brought that here, and mm -hmm. now that has gone statewide. We're really proud of that. Mm -hmm. That was under Ted Mabel's leadership. And, um, and when Goodrich, within his supervisory yep. union, he saw that that was something that fit in with his overall uh, vision of helping the, s the schools as a whole be well, helping the schools as a whole um, be successful. I think historically we used to, again, identify specific children that needed additional help, and Youth Mental Health First Aid is about making the entire school body better, healthier. And so when, in partnership with us, we brought um, his staff in. We actually had eight of our employees there, mm -hmm. and we did a full day training with his staff. Um, and it went extremely well. We had a lot of success with that. That uh, Now, looking to the future, um, what challenges do you see for our community? I think one of the things, back to the ACE scores yep. that we have, is um, in our community, we know that about 50% of the people in our community would score at least a one, that those are what the stats mm -hmm. would bear mm -hmm. out, would score at least a one on the ACEs. We know that about 23% of the people in our community would score a, at least a, a two. So when you think about services, it's really not about 
um, a mental illness per se. It's about how do we intervene. If we know that 50% of our entire population has, would score a one, that means it, it's all of us could benefit from some type of health, mm -hmm. um, some type of intervention so, to, sure. to, to, to make things better. Um, and so we really want to develop some programming um, to provide that type of care that's more pervasive within our community. Um, again, all with the goal of keeping people well. Uh, another example I think of, of that is our um, positive behavioral supports that we provide to schools. And that is, again, it's another model that we've partnered with local schools to increase the culture of a school as a whole to, to help them be well. So when I think of a challenge, it's we could all benefit from something. So instead of treating individuals, we want to treat the community as a whole. So some of these types of interventions are positive behavioral support in schools, youth mental health first aid. These are community initiatives to treat the school as mm -hmm. a whole. Um, thinking of challenges, another challenge I think we do face is uh, our, our substance abuse problem. Yes. And this is a national issue that we, we do have a significant number of people um, in our own community do struggle with substance abuse. This is something that we, uh, we want to target. We want to target head on. And to, to be successful, we are going to need to work really closely with our community partners on that. Um, we also know we're going to be better off treating substance abuse if we can intervene early. We don't want to wait until someone has an opioid addiction sure. and then intervene then. We want to intervene um, early on. Yeah. Um, and so I always think of it as, you know, we want to help the person that's calling today, but we also want to help the person that we think might need to call tomorrow. So how do we do both? And one of the ideas that we have that we are doing um, is for the first time this year, we actually have a substance abuse clinician embedded in every single high school within Franklin County. And we think that's a way to provide, um, partner with schools, uh, to provide education about substance abuse, early intervention. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, kind of, you know, um, nip that in the bud, those people that it might be starting to use, get them the supports that they need to get them back on a path to being well as opposed to a path towards addiction. One of the uh, more creative ideas that we are trying to do right now is we are working with our primary care models our primary care partners mm -hmm. through the Notch and NMC and talking to them about potentially embedding substance abuse clinicians, adolescent substance abuse clinicians directly in primary care offices. So when people go in to access um, health care in their primary care office, those primary care physicians can actually make a referral right down the hall for substance abuse treatment or mental health treatment. And we see that integrated care, that model of integrated care looking at people holistically, physical health, mental health, substance abuse, we think we're going to have more success long term and we can bend the opioid problem. And you know, when you talk about integration into um, schools, you talk about the uh, uh, primary care providers, um, NCSS also within the last several years has become integrated in law enforcement, which I think is another area that has shown some great, great uh, outcomes over the past couple of years. There's a couple areas that we are um, leaders in the state, and we are incredibly proud of this. One is with, um, we are the only region in Vermont that, that has um, partnerships, mental health clinicians embedded in 100% of our um, our, our health care provider, home, home yeah, providers. Yeah, medically centered homes, yeah. And, we are incredibly proud of that fact. Mm -hmm. The second thing that we're really proud of is, as you referenced, we have m mental health clinicians embedded directly in law enforcement, and that's both local and state. And we think by doing that, it makes the law enforcement officers more effective when they outreach to intervene in a situation that sometimes they're coming at it from a law enforcement point of view, but sometimes they might need a mental health perspective mm -hmm. right there to help de-escalate the situation. And having one of our clinicians ride along and be right there with them is incredibly helpful. And then with the medical homes, having primary care be able to refer right down the hallway so someone can access mental health right down the hall, we think we're gonna have significantly better outcomes as a result of that. Well, you know, one of the things that does, Todd, is when you think of the delay that normally people take in seeking treatment, mental health treatment, because of stigma. 
And there's a lot of people who the last thing they want to do is walk through our doors to see an outpatient therapist or what have you. However, as you suggest, if it's someone down the hall at a primary care provider that they've been dealing with for years, that eliminates all of that quote unquote stigma, which I find very encouraging because of the delays normally that it takes people to seek treatment. Mm -hmm. They actually can begin to start the you know, process of treatment a lot earlier on mm -hmm. than in the old days, so to speak. Oftentimes, when people are accessing mental health services, there's a window of opportunity that's there. And if we cannot get services in right away, or if there are barriers to accessing care, that window closes mm -hmm. and that person will not access the care that they need. So what we've really tried hard to do um, again with our partnerships with our, our uh, primary care physicians with the notch and um, and NMC is create points of access so we have at places where people can access mental health services in our agency mm -hmm. and a lot of people do come directly to our mm -hmm. agency yep. but they can also access mental health services in primary care we can help them um, through law enforcement we have a clinician embedded right here at NMC in their emergency department and so all of those things give people greater access to care. We have a team of clinicians embedded in area schools. And again, all those things give access. And we're, um, we have one of the highest access rates in the state when compared to our peers. And one of the reasons why we think our rate is so high is because we do have so many access points across a really broad continuum of care. And that's a really good thing. You know, what's nice, you, you mentioned a uh, clinician embedded in the emergency department at NMC. And one of the nice things about that is that it's not just that clinician who is there on site, but all of the other staff members that surround that individual at NCSS who can also assist, depending on what the circumstances are. We, I, that, that makes total sense, that we have a clinician there, his name is Matt, mm -hmm. and he is embedded in the emergency department. And people see Matt there, and they make referrals to Matt, and he's helping people. But what they don't see is there, he's just really the tip of the iceberg. There's an entire team of people behind him that he can bring into services, make referrals to, can facilitate connections to help those people get connected to services as quickly as possible. And having that person embedded directly in the emergency department through that NMC partnership has just been incredibly helpful. Um, we hear from the docs that they um, just really value, they really appreciate this mm -hmm. person being there. So it, it's, that's one of the partnerships that we feel really good about. Yeah. Now, um, are there any final thoughts that you'd like to share that maybe we haven't covered? One thing I think that we, we do often find is our services, sometimes it feels like our services are a little out in front of the changes that healthcare is experiencing. We know services need to be upstream. We know we need to be targeting the social determinants of health. We know we need to be minimizing, uh, bringing supports to minimize people's scoring positive on, on the ACE, scoring high on the, on the ACE tool. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes our funding is still structured such that um, it's still kind of in an old school type of model yes. where people need to really be um, sick in order for us to provide that level of care. And so one of the things that we're, we're, we tend to be very active in with our, our state partners and with the legislature is helping us think about how can we shift the way that we are funded for services so we can both say, you know, we want to serve the people that are, are currently sick, but we also want to get upstream and serve people that are, are um, uh, at risk of becoming sick to keep them well. And so we're working with our state partners about how do we shift some of that funding to allow us to provide services upstream in a more population-based approach. And we've had some success with that in some of the models such as the positive behavioral supports, mental health first aid. Those are some of the initiatives we had that have allowed us to take a more population health approach to care. And you know what's really interesting about this whole discussion is that if you go back five years, 10 years, uh, it always would be the minute that somebody had proposed, say, a prevention program. It would be on the docket, but the very first thing that would get cut when it came time for budget cuts would be anything that would have to do with prevention. So therefore, you were further, 
taking the model along to dealing with people on the back end all the time in a, in a treatment or recovery mm -hmm. mode as opposed to trying to do what you're talking about, um, which is a complete, you know, 180 uh, turn. And I know that's where healthcare wants to go and what have you, and it's a very difficult thing to, to, to achieve, but it has to be achieved because otherwise, uh, and the other, the other thing, Todd, is the, uh, the aging population, not only of our community, but the state of Vermont and the country for that matter. If we don't start to turn that uh, or bend that curve, uh, the, the implications that we're looking at. We definitely, I think that is one of the significant challenges is how do we do both? Again, how do we help that person that's calling today? Because we know they, they need help. They legitimately need help and we want to intervene to help them. But how do we also help that person that we're worried they might be calling tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And so the, the challenge is how do we take our resources and position them away through both internal structures and with our community partners to really pull together in the same direction to do both? How do we treat people that um, need the help today and intervene to prevent people from needing that help tomorrow? And one thing we always talk about is that's too big for any one agency to do alone. Mm -hmm. And so we really do need our community partners. We really do need um, you know, NMC, The Notch, Home Health, those are the kind of partners that we need to really maximize in order for we're going to be together. We're going to be successful together. And, and that is so crucial. And, you know, as I talk to other people from around the state, you know, one of the things that becomes pretty clear is that although every community is trying to achieve this as far as community partners working together and collaborating and speaking from the same uh, hymnal, so to speak, it isn't really being achieved everywhere yet. I think there's maybe some other barriers and roadblocks that need to be knocked down before they can get there. I think we're pretty fortunate uh, in this part of the state in that truly a lot of uh, great work has already been accomplished. We're, we're, we're lucky to be here that um, recently uh, there was a federal visit that, that uh, a federal team looked across the nation and said, who's doing integrated care really well? Who's partnering really well? And they recognized Vermont as one of the leaders mm -hmm. nationally in integrated mm -hmm. care. So they came to Vermont and then they asked our state leaders, okay, within your state, who is doing it well? And our state leaders directed them uh, in part to, to us, to mm -hmm. Franklin Grand yes. Isle County. And a panel of us went down and presented to these, uh, this federal team. And the panel was NMC, the Notch, and NCSS, and it gave us a chance to really talk about our partnerships, our collaborations, because again, there's a strong commitment that we are only gonna be successful um, if we're doing this together, pulling in the same direction. Yeah, and how true that is. Mm -hmm. So with that, Todd, uh, our time is up for this month, and I wanna thank you for being here, and uh, certainly know that everybody at NCSS is behind uh, your vision and, and continuing to move NCSS in the right direction. Well, thank you, Joe. So, with that being said, I, I do want to thank Todd Bauman for being on the show today and sharing his insights on the importance of the programs and services that NCSS offers in collaboration with community partners to achieve better health outcomes for all local residents. Now, before we go, I'd like to introduce a new segment to the show that we'll end each episode with in the future. And it's being called NCSS Factoid of the Month. This time of year, it's back to school. It also marks the 16th year that NCSS has partnered with schools in our area. Dating back to 2001, NCSS began providing services that include wellness and prevention, behavioral interventionists, clinicians, trauma response, truancy specialists, and supports for students with autism spectrum disorder. We also wrap students and their families with services outside of the school day. Our tagline of we're here for you isn't just some idle promise. NCSS offers an array of specialty care to meet the needs of over 4,000 individuals that we serve each year. I want to thank you, the viewer, for spending time with us again this month. You can learn more about NCSS and all of our programs and services by logging on to ncssinc.org. 
I'm Joe Halko, and I'll be back next month with another episode of NCSS Here For You. This has been another episode of NCSS Here For You. We hope that you found today's discussion informative and educational. Since 1958, Northwestern Counseling and Support Services has been providing access to high-quality services which promote healthy living and emotional well-being to the residents of Franklin and Grand Isle counties. Over the years, as the needs of the community have changed, so too have the programs and services that we make available to assist children, adolescents, adults, families, and seniors. Thanks once again for tuning in this month. And CSS's purpose remains creating a stronger community, one person at a time.